there, Glocal Citizens. It's Florence Adu, your host for the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around doing something in the world. We're doing our remote interviews and we're still going around the world. And we found ourselves, me and Accra Ghana, and my guest, Leye Adele, who is an author. He's in London. So I don't want to get too much into describing this wonderful author, which I discovered. Just a little background. I was in Abuja last uh, two years ago, and I picked up his book. And in the last month or so, I, I actually finally picked it up and read it. And it was one of those things that I just couldn't put down. So I was so excited that um, I was able to make a connection and invite him on the show. So without any further delay, our guest for today, Leigh Adenle, tell us more about yourself. Well, thanks for having me on the show. And um, tell you about myself. I don't know. Um, what would you like to know? Okay. So tell us about what, how you actually um, started your writing career and what inspired you in that way? What are some of your inspirations? Okay, so I think I've always written. I can't, I can't remember a time when I was in writing. I think it started with um, love notes that you pass to people in class in primary school. And I think from there I graduated to full-blown, not paying attention to the teacher and just writing crap in the back of my school notebooks. And I'd either be drawing cartoons, you know, with storylines, or I'd be writing short stories. And I've just always enjoyed writing. And I think it's probably because I grew up, A, surrounded by books. My maternal grandfather had a very extensive library. My parents had a very extensive library. They had a whole room that was the library. And... When I was still too young, I remember picking up a copy of Marquis de Sword. And yeah, anyway, so I've always been surrounded by books. My father went on to become a, a publisher. And so my childhood was, you know, the smell of the massive Hedelberg printing machines and paper off cuts and, the, you know, where they did the gulletin, the cutting of the books and all of that. Uh -huh. And I remember my very first copy of Gulliver's Travel was from that press. My father had uh, used to print for the University of Ibadan then. Uh -huh. So I used to read a lot of the books. And yeah, so I've, I don't know. It's just been surrounded by books and, you know, discovering books at a very young age. And oh yeah, also... My grandfather, after whom I'm named, also wrote in his time. My, I have an uncle who wrote. I have an aunt who wrote. I have two aunts who've written. And yeah, I've always been surrounded by books. It's in the blood, I guess. Yeah, it sounds like it. Definitely. So <laughs> that's very interesting. So we know you're in London now. So where were you local growing up? Tell us more about that. Oh, I'm a total product of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. You know. Nigeria made me the man into the man I am, into the human I am. I grew up in, a, in an amazingly sleepy little, well, not little, massive, massive city, uh, Ibadan. And Ibadan, okay. Yeah, I grew up in Ibadan, did my university, my primary school, my secondary school, my university. Then like most Nigerians, I, well, actually, I didn't move straight to Lagos. I actually moved out of Nigeria for my master's. And then later in life, I went back to Nigeria for business. And there, that was Lagos, you know. And for a long time, I was, actually, I was, there was a five-year period in my life when I did Lagos, London every month. Wow. You know, which was, yeah, they thought I was a cocaine pusher. You should have seen <laughs> the way. No, seriously, man. Anytime I'm leaving the Lagos, yeah. Lagos airport, Murtala Mohammed, right? Anytime they look at my passport and they see yes. how much I've been traveling, you know, they then look at me and I mean, I was so silly because you're traveling every month, you know, you're not, I didn't have any luggage. In fact, after some time, I stopped taking a laptop because I've got a laptop in the house in the flat in London. So I didn't, I yeah. just didn't want to have to take anything with me, you know, and I, I was only going to be gone for like two, three days in London. Then I'll be back in Nigeria. And they look at me, they uh -huh. look at my passport, and then I I lie to you not. They would poke my tummy and say, 
you know, this one that you're always traveling, what kind of business are you doing? <laughs> and then I'll be like, listen, I do, I mean, IT, I have this business. What do you mean IT, computer? We, well, we know that people that do computer, they don't travel like you. <laughs> and God knows how many times they've x-rayed me. Wow. You know, I've, I've actually seen, I've seen what I look like inside, all of me. <laughs> so and, when they literally uh, kick you off and take you to the x-ray place, like yeah, for the I've, body? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow. full x-ray, man. Full x-ray. Wow. I, I don't blame them. You know, there's this young guy sure. yeah. who's just flying out of the town of, of the country every month. You know, what yeah. it was is, right, I had the girlfriend then, and the agreement with her was she would let me go off and do this business in Nigeria if I mm-hmm. would come back to her every month. You mm. know, so I had a business in Nigeria that was trying to a startup. But the only way I was allowed to be doing that was to go back to London, spend a weekend with her, go back to Nigeria, go back to London, spend one week in London, go back to Nigeria for a month. It was, it was, oh man, it was, it was, I hated airports, you know, I couldn't stand the thought of going to an airport. Yeah, I can imagine. um, Yeah, we later married and then. um, Okay, well, it was worth it then. Yeah, and um, then I thought, well, now that we're married, you know, you got what you wanted, you know, I don't need to come to London every month. Then I stayed in Nigeria for six months. And okay. that, that ruined the wedding, the marriage rather. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Got yeah. it. So, so that's so interesting because that is kind of the epitome of local citizenship. Like you were back and forth for work for, for this business. So just tell us, just to veer off, you were doing a startup. So we talk about business quite a bit on this podcast. Um, mm. Tell us a little bit more about that process. And, you know, we know oh, you're an author now, but that was something that was a, a long-term endeavor, I'm guessing. Oh, yeah, it was, um, oh, man, it's crazy. I haven't spoken about this in years. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm talking close in uh, like 15 years ago now, you know. Oh, wow, um, okay. 10, 15 years ago, I think. Let me try and remember. Uh-huh. Yeah. I don't I do not do well with dates, but okay. <clears throat> I got married in 20. 20- 10, I want to say. Okay. So yeah, like the 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It was about 10, 15 years ago. So way it was, uh, I had come up with this idea then to run a lottery in Nigeria via SMS. We didn't have smartphones then. There was no 2G, 3G or 5G that some people for some reason think is causing COVID-19. Anyway, so I got this idea to run a lottery via SMS. So I went off and I bought two GSM modems. It, like your normal modems, you connect to phones, right? To, to computers, but it takes SIM cards. Right. And then I built, a, I, you would not know it if you look at me now, but I used to be a computer nerd. Okay. So I built a piece of software, a piece of lottery type software. And the way you play it is via SMS. Okay. So I set it up. I set up a computer in my house as a modem, as a server. I had two GSM modems connected, one to receive and one to send responses, right? Uh-huh. I got in touch with a bunch of friends in Nigeria and they thought, wow, that's exciting. Let's do it. Right. And before you know what's happening, I was on a flight to Lagos. I uh, got to Lagos. We got a national, we got a Nigerian, a Lagos State Lottery license. Okay. We got, NTN Nigeria was the only worthwhile network. They only had 2 million subscribers then. Can you imagine? They signed wow. an exclusive deal with us. Uh-huh. We got, I want to say First Atlantic Bank. I believe that's the bank. They gave us a 30 million Naira overdraft facility so that we could pay out you know, people without having to wait for money. It was amazing. We did the pilot with um, MTN. It was going great until one morning I'm in my office. I've actually, right now, I'm cutting out a whole load of the story because I'm saving it for my autobiography. Okay. Anyway, okay. <laughs> one, morning, one morning I'm in my office in Dolphin Estate and I receive it. I get that this is dispatch rider from MTN comes over on a bike has come to give us this letter. And the letter basically says, you know, due to a change in uh, Lagos State Lottery and Gambling, Gaming and Betting Laws, your all former holders of, you know, lottery licenses have been, have had their licenses revoked. And for that reason, we can no longer continue our relationship with you. I'm like, what the hell? 
Wow. Yeah. And, and you heard it from MTN, not from them. Well, actually, I heard it first from the son of the family that did it. But I thought it was just bullshit. And he said to my face in his house the night before, my wow. family is going to make sure we're the only ones who can do a lottery in Nigeria. And I thought wow. it was bullshit. You know, I thought it was just this dude is drunk again, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, um, and I actually read in the newspaper so it wasn't like the discussion. It invited me over to his house late at night. And then I arrived there with my then chief technical officer because we'd gone out drinking. Basically, after work, we were working hard and playing hard, you know, kids. Sure. So we'd walk till very late. I mean, we were we, we were getting to the office at 6 a.m. in Nigeria. Nobody does that, you know, leaving at like 9 p.m. And then when we leave, you know, we're going to some bar to go get drunk and discuss all the little challenges and and victories of the day anyway so uh this dude that dropped me off when i got the call from another person another lagos family saying hey meet me at this person's house so i call my guy i'm like hey dude guess what this person just called now the background to this is that the family had been in talks with us to invest in our lottery game in our lottery business right uh, mm -hmm. and so my friend turns back, right? My colleague turns back, picks me up. We go to their house. And this guy says to me flat out, how much would it cost to buy you out? I thought he was joking, right? Right. <laughs> so, I threw up, so I threw out some silly, silly figure, which was grossly undervalued. I mean, the business was valued at, let me put it this way, at the valuation of the business, we were selling shares to seasoned investors in Nigeria uh -huh. and my shareholdings alone puts me at a million pounds then. So had I been selling my shares, you know, I would have netted myself a million pounds as a bloody 20 something year old boy. You know? Right. Um, right. Yeah. Anyway. So, so we go to this guy's house and he says, how much would it cost to buy you out? Trial some crazy amount. He says, well, he just wanted to ask us because, you know, my family has decided that we're the only ones that are going to be able to do a lottery in Nigeria. In, sorry, in Lagos State. And, uh -huh. you know, we, we laugh about it. We're drinking on his, you know, at his dining table. We think it's bullshit. And then the next day that happens, you know. And, um, wow. yeah, I went from being this guy who, this young man who on paper was worth over a million quid who, you know, was being courted by some of the richest people in Lagos, who had uh, shareholders who were some of the movers and shakers of the Nigerian economy, not Lagos economy, but the Nigerian economy. Sure, so, yeah. I was broke, you know, I remortgaged my property so I could pay after a while. I mean, we, I tried to keep going. I did everything. I went to, I went to try and get a another license from or your state because fuck you, you know, sorry <laughs> it's sms <laughs> you can't stop us you know right right uh, yeah. i did everything you know and i wasn't i'd given up i mean that first trip to lagos to just set up the business and talk to mtn and go do demonstrations at the airport going back to london i called my bosses and i quit oh wow you know yeah, yeah. i quit my job in 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 the docklands i just called them and said look guys this is what's happened. I've decided I'm going to stay in Nigeria. This was on my way back to London. I didn't tell them I was coming back to London, right? Sure. So I quit. Came back to London. I, I rented out my flat. I moved back. I, it was it was crazy. And then I remortgaged my property to the end. Ah. Why? Because when the company was then, you know, when when we didn't have any more money coming, I couldn't in, in good faith be taking money from investors, right? Yeah. So I was paying, I mean, I had to let go of the stuff that we had pushed from Arthur Anderson, you know, because mm. I mean, their, their salaries were good salaries. But yeah. I was concerned about the messengers and the cleaners and the drivers and stuff like that. So I was paying mm. them out of my pocket, you know, mm. and yeah, I quickly became this extremely broke person who just refused to give up. And then I came up with another idea. And this uh -huh. idea was, you know what? I've learned my lesson. I have another idea. I'm going to get patents for this before I talk about it. So I built it. I developed it. I got a patent lawyer, an IP lawyer. 
We put yeah. in the IP of the patent applications. We got a patent and everything. And then I started talking about it. I sat with Dora Kunili, the then DG of NAVDAT, to demonstrate it. Basically, it was it's called APVS. I've actually kept up the website. Okay. Uh, APVSglobal.com. I think it's still live. Very okay. dated website now. Anyway, uh, it's called it was it's uh, the anti piracy product verification system. Wow. Which okay. basically, basically, when you buy a packet of a drug that is often pirated, you know, you would get uh, yeah. a unique code that comes with it that is concealed in it, and you can okay. text that unique identification number, a uh -huh. random number based generated through atmospheric noise. You can text that number to a special code that will then tell you whether, if it's real and it's not been used before, it'll tell you, okay, the number you just tried per, is, uh, belongs to this medicine with this expiry date and this flag number, and it's a 12 blister pack, blah, blah, you know, stuff like that. If the number has been used before, it'll reply to you and say, the number you just tried has been used before on this time by this phone number. So maybe you used it, but you didn't get your reply on time. If the right. number as does not exist, it'll tell you this number does not exist. In addition, it'll also tell you if the number does not exist, if you want, if you feel, you know, if you want to report potential possible pirate product piracy, please call this number, right? Yeah. And I actually also married it to the lottery idea where for every legitimate check you make on a mm -hmm. protected product, you get your phone number gets entered into a monthly loyalty draw. And uh, yeah, I thought, I thought it was brilliant, right? And I demonstrated it to the Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Association of Nigeria. They endorsed it. I got a written endorsement from the Nigerian Copyright Commission. Everything was going smoothly until one day I'm sat in my hotel room in Abuja in the morning and I listened to the new DG, this dude from America, quoting verbatim from my proposal. <laughs> <laughs> I shit you not. This man says, I'll wow. never forget. This is something I wrote. He says, we have put the power of detection into the hands of the final consumer. And at wow. that point, at that point when I'd spent God knows how many tens of thousands of pounds of my own money, how many millions and millions of naira of other people's money, jeopardized my, because I'd married by that time, my marriage yeah. and all of that. I yeah. thought, you know, if not just some family that is rich, some wealthy family, but if even the government will steal a business idea from a young man, yeah, what the fuck am I doing here? Sorry. <laughs> I, no, I get it. I get it. Yeah. yeah. So, and then so I then you left. Well, I didn't leave immediately because what happened was the wife then at that point was also like giving me an ultimatum, you know, choose okay. between your business and myself. And I, I still had a lot of fight in me. See, um, oh. I, I had an entrepreneurial spirit because that was all I knew. My yeah. father, who, I mean, the man did the medicine in Harvard, worked at St. Mary's Hospital, went back to Nigeria, and after a little stint in medicine, he went into business. Okay. My eldest, my, all my brothers are into business for themselves. My uncles, everybody around me. My grandmother from my father's side, in fact, was a, the matriarch. You know, my, my, my grandfather married well. <laughs> she was okay. a businesswoman and she was a multimillionaire in those days, right? And it was yeah. the money she had, I believe, that led to the kingmakers choosing her husband to be king, you know? So I was surrounded by business people. This was all I knew, you mm -hmm. know? I didn't know nine to five, so it was, it, it was me. So I still had a lot of fight in me, you know? I wasn't going to give up. I wasn't going to pack you all up. But when the wife gave me an ultimatum and I thought to myself, do I want to be, do I want to have a failed marriage or a series of failed marriages like my father did? Oh, okay. I thought, no, I don't want that, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want that for myself, you know? Right. So yeah. I, I gave you all up. I, I said to Nigeria, hey, you've won. I went back to England and within two months, the marriage was over because- Oh, no. Yeah, that was when I'd stayed away for six months, thinking, well, now that we're married, you know, let me yeah, be, you know. Right. I went back and I basically, I don't blame her because I wasn't the man she married. You sure. know, she married this awkwardly mobile young boy who, 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 you know, was buying properties. And then 
I didn't yeah. tell her when I was selling properties to fund the business in Nigeria, even though it's my money, but you know, I should have told her. Right. right. <laughs> so, so I came back broke. I came back defeated. I came back not wanting to socialize with friends that I left in England five years ago because now they're way up there in their careers and I've lost everything to fraudulent country of mine, Nigeria. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I don't blame her. I just wasn't the person she married, you know? Sure. Yeah. So it didn't work out. And what then happened was one morning I just moved out of the property um, that we bought together, but I left it for her. Another property mm -hmm. that we owned together that well, we, we bought based on money from remortgaging the first one, I left it to her. I didn't, I didn't do any of that, you know, let's please anything, just left it. And I just mm -hmm. moved into my uncle's house and I lived on my uncle's sofa. And that period was when I started, I went back to my first love. Oh. I just started writing the first book, Easy Motion Tourist. Okay. You know, and... I started a, a satire website, a Nigerian satire website, mm -hmm. uh, Wazobia Report. I started writing again. So I was writing satirical pieces with different, different, so then it's different assumed names, you know. Yeah. I've got some people to join me at some point. And it was political satire mostly. In fact, we're going to, we're almost going to trouble because some of the pieces would write, which to any sane human being, this is, this is, this is satire. We had yes. the government responding to it, you know? <laughs> like we had early the government. <laughs> yeah, it was in the papers. I, I remember waking up, I'd written a piece one night where I'd written that Okonjo Iwela, uh, after inspecting, after being, after Okonjo Iwela was uh, employed as the finance minister and economic lead team or whatever, I wrote a piece that Okonjo Iwela resigns after inspecting federation accounts. And... The, the piece was just was supposedly her resignation letter where she says, uh, dear president, thank you for blah, 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 blah. But after looking at the accounts, you know, <laughs> you, you need more prayer and miracles than anything. Silly stuff. <laughs> Next day, I wake up and it was on fire. Newspapers are talking about it. Oh, Gunja Will has, has resigned, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, why can't you guys see it? Can't you tell this bullshit? Even the website tells you, right, that, you know, this yeah. is not real. Right. You know? And then Okunje Wela's secretary responds and says that, yes, based on their investigations, they know that they've deterred, they found out that these are the detractors of the government and the big sponsored agents trying to bring down the government. <laughs> it was amazing. Wow. Anyway, so, yeah, so that breakup, the marriage breakup, I mean, losing... Someone I didn't even deserve in the first place. I don't know what got into her, how she thought, you know, she should marry someone like me. She could have done way better than me. Anyway, <laughs> you know, after losing that person, you know, I just mm -hmm. took all that pain. Yeah. And I just went back to my very first love, which is writing. And the original story was, I was just writing posts. I just post, I, I'd gone to my mom's, to my brother's house and my younger brother had come there as well in London. And my mother was around uh, from Nigeria. And when, when she's with her boys, three of us, right. We uh -huh. talk about everything in the world, you know, yeah. and we were, we were solving the world's problems as usual mm -hmm. in my elder brother's living room. And, mm -hmm. you know, we started talking about naked mutilated bodies that turn up on Lagos about the expressway. Now, my mother used to be Director General Women Affairs or your state, Director General Education or your state's Director General Health or your state. But one thing she's always been, there's always been importance to her is the welfare of women, especially young children in school, right? Okay. The education of young women, the well being of young women, and stuff like that. So it was only natural that we'd be talking about stuff like that and about what can we do about this? Why are these young girls being you know, cut up and stuff like that. I know the assumption always when when, we, when people see these bodies, right? Mutilated bodies is always, yeah, it must be a prostitute, which annoys me because that's the worst form of victim blaming. Almost like, yeah, it must be a prostitute. So therefore she they deserved it. it, you know? Yeah. And I think it's something to do with, it's usually young girls and they're usually naked, right? Mm -hmm. But in my mind, I just thought right there as we were having the conversation, I just thought of three different things that could be going on rather than 
ritual killings, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of them I thought about that didn't make it into the book, but I still believe is strongly possible. I think we have, I know, I know, I don't think, I know we have serial killers in Nigeria. Mm. You know, if if you think about it, right? Mm -hmm. Every country, every human population has the same amount of psychopaths. Yes. Same ratio. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So we probably have serial killers in Nigeria who are just having the time of their lives. I mean, once in a while they meet, they catch somebody with human parts, you know, and people think, oh, it's rituals. Well, yeah, we do know that rituals is bullshit. I mean, it doesn't take long for people to realize there's no such thing as magic, you know. Sure. But, well, I lie, actually, people still go to church, so maybe it takes a long time. But anyway, (laughs) anyway, right? I believe we have ritual uh, serial killers in Nigeria. I believe we have them all over Africa. Yeah, I, I believe they're all over the world. You're absolutely right. Yeah, they're all over the world, you know. And I did my research online looking for just crazy stories. And the more I looked at some of those stories, the more I'm like, no, that guy was not a cannibal. Or right, mm-hmm. okay, yeah, he was a cannibal, but it's a mental problem. He's probably been doing it forever, you know. Mm-hmm. And yeah, but anyway, out of all the ideas I got, one of them stuck with me and I thought, oh, damn, this could be what's happening. And then I went home that evening back to my place, well, to my uncle's place. I was renting the house from him, basically. Mm-hmm. And I went back to this to this house and I just wrote the first chapter mm-hmm. as a Facebook note. Okay. Right. And I posted it on Facebook and I forgot about it. Next yeah. evening after work, I came home and there was loads and loads and loads of comments under this note and people yeah. wanted to know what happened next and so i wrote one chapter of the original draft every night unedited which is a big thing because i'm dyslexic i cannot spell to save my life uh-huh. and i wrote one chapter every night unedited with a uh-huh. bottle of wine blue cheese and benson and edges by my side i used to smoke them <laughs> and i just I just crapped out the entire book in about 30 days. Wow. And then, yeah, I made a lot of friends on Facebook then. People just added me so they could read my notes because people were telling them. About, I remember some dude saw me at Liverpool Street Station. And you know when someone is approaching you with that smile of, hey, recognition, and then sure. you don't recognize them, so you start faking mutual recognition, you know. <laughs> and yeah. the guy was like, and the guy said, no, 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 Leia, you don't know me, but... I, I'm your friend on Facebook and I've been reading your notes. I'm like, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> you know, and <laughs> yeah, and then I left it. I didn't do anything again with it for like two, three years. Okay. And then mm-hmm. I just thought that that's after that, after I finished that is when I started the website. Okay. Or rather I was doing the website already, the the satire website. Yeah. Anyway, that was just, I just wanted to build my own content management system and build a website and do all of that. So I was building, I was coding the website at night, writing stories during the day to post onto it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'd forgotten about the Facebook story. Then I wrote another story on the website uh, called Chronicles of a Run Scale. Mm. And that went viral. This is about eight, nine years ago. It went viral. And mm-hmm. till to, I mean, my name is still not on the website. It's, near, it's still not on the story or anything. And I think when that went viral, I thought, you know what? You've always wanted to be a writer. Your your childhood is full of uncompleted yeah. manuscripts that you started yeah. of, you know, trying to write a novel by yourself. Mm-hmm. I even wrote one in, in longhand that I lost yeah. in my first year university, thereabouts, I think. Yeah. Anyway. So I thought, well, let's give it a try. And I took that story and I rewrote it. And after God knows how many queries, I got two up two offers, one in England, one in Nigeria. Uh-huh. I went with the Nigeria, um, maybe not the wisest choice, but you know, <laughs> I, I was being patriotic. Anyway, I went with the Nigeria and, and here we are. Wow. So... I want to get back to the story because that's, I read your first book. And again, that's Easy Motion Tourist for all of you. And I'll, that'll be in the show notes. So we got to Why the Wear, but now I have this question I ask my guests and it's, what is local speak for you? So you as a, a writer hear a lot. And so I think you 
by having that conversation with your family and all the things you hear and how they synthesize into your writing and into who you are, my question is, what is a word or phrase or saying that is a meaningful part of your local experience? And how did you come to value it as your local speak? Ego beta. Say it again. Ego beta. Ego beta. Yep. Ah. It'll get well. It'll be good. Yes. Things will work out. Yes. Or if you, if you want to be biblical about it, this too shall pass. Yes. 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 And that's pigeon. It's pigeon. And it's, um, it sums up the national spirit of Nigeria, you know. Yeah. Anything happens in Nigeria, people are quick to tell you, it go better, it'll get better. You know, even the government uses it in their advertisement, you know, whatever. It go better, it go better. We, we just have this strong belief that it'll get better. And it wasn't until I started doing training as a coach uh-huh. that I understood just how powerful it is to be able to say it will get better. Because, I mean, you might know emotional intelligence, one of the five emotional intelligences. In fact, the last one of the five emotional intelligences is resilience. Yes. The ability to pick yourself up when, you know, when you fall, when things haven't gone your way. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think, I think that's quite profound. Mm-hmm. The fact that it is considered a form of intelligence to be able to pick yourself up when things haven't worked out, mm-hmm. it, it, it still blows my mind, you know? And I'm like, well, actually, that's what Nigerians have always known. You know, things are going bad. Doesn't mean I'm going to give up because you know what? It'll get better. It'll go better. Right. You know, it's not working out right now. For instance, okay, I'm trying to lose some weight, right? Not, not me, but just say, I'm trying to lose some weight. Mm-hmm. And then one night I go party and I eat way too much. I drink too much and get onto the scale the next day and the scale is betraying me. Mm-hmm. I can do one of two things. I can decide, screw this, it's not working. And then I just order that pizza. Or I can decide, well, this is a minor setback. I'm going to learn from this and then I'm going to get better at watching what I eat. Yeah. You know, and it's it's that difference, it's that mindset, is that it's being able to have that growth mindset, is that the you know, the resilience to pick yourself back up. You know, you're heartbroken. Well, yeah, screw it. I'm gonna learn from it. You know, I'll I'll, I'll figure out what I did wrong. And even if what I did wrong was dating somebody like them, you know, I won't do it again in the future. Right. You know, yeah. And then you pick yourself back up. And that ability to just view failure as nothing more than that. Mm-hmm. It's it's an atomic thing. It happened at a point in time. It need not affect the the rest of your life, of your experiences. It's done. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel that that, yep, that was five seconds ago I failed. This is now. This is the future already. That failure is in the past. Yeah. That failure cannot continue to affect me. Right. You know, I can I can do better in the next interview. The next time I have, you know, we have this thing we call chemistry meetings. When I when I'm about to get a new client, we first have a chemistry meeting to see if we gel. Mm-hmm. So if if I go to a chemistry meeting and I mess up, maybe maybe you know I don't know. I say the wrong things. I'm not giving them the right kind of attention. We don't gel. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to beat myself up because oh, this is this guy's. I, I wanted to have this client, you know, I've never had a client in government or I've never had a client in whatever. I'm just going to learn from it because it doesn't mean I won't be able to get such a client in the future. Sure. You know? Yeah. And it's that ability to just not let failure, not let hard times, not just failure, but difficult times. Coronavirus, you know, lockdown, it, it doesn't need to kill you. It's going to go away and things will get better. And Mm. that really sums the way I live my life now. You know, it go better. Nice, nice, nice one. Um, So so going back to your first work, Easy Motion Tourist and and how you, the process for doing that. So you, you wrote it basically as a series of Facebook notes, and then you later found a publisher. I want to get deeper into some of the characters and how you develop characters in general, because I think that's the key part of making compelling or creating compelling fiction, number one, and just understanding how to go about writing, because you are a tech person by training or, and then you're also a coach. How did you learn how to write beyond just doing it potentially? And 
just hearing about your mother, I'm, I'm, I want to ask a, a side question is whether or not the female lead in the, in the story is inspired by your mom. Uh, actually, um, I'll take that next, the female lead, because there's a story to that. Okay. Anyway, so how did I, how did I learn to write? Um, first, let me say there's no such thing as talent. It's a lie. It's an artificial barrier some writers put up to dissuade other people joining the industry. There's no such thing as talent. I mean, I, I remember I was in a school in um, Abu Dhabi and uh, I was there for the Sharjah Literary Festival. And this kid in this primary school said to me, when did you know you were going to be a talented writer? And I said to this dude, I'm like, I'm facing the class, I'm like, what do you want to be when you grow up? He wants to be an engineer. I'm like, cool. are you a talented engineer? And he says to me, well, I don't know yet. I'm like, well, exactly. Right. You know, you might become the best engineer in the world, the best physicist, the best surgeon. They would call you talented, but you were not born with those skills. Yeah. You can't even inherit them from your, your parents, you know. You need to learn it. I wanted to write. I have always wanted to write. I have always loved the books. You know, I, I had the kind of parents that you go ask them a question rather than tell you the answer. They'll tell you to go look in this encyclopedia or go and get this book in the library or whatever. You know, they encourage us to read and we love to read, you know, and which I think is very important for kids. You know, yeah. get them reading at a very young age yeah. and let them discover this this whole world beyond that which surrounds them, which is accessible to them through books. Yeah. Well. So I always wanted to read and I think the, to write. And I think the most important thing, if you want to be a writer, is if you already have the passion, you really want to do it. That's the most important thing. If you really, really want to do it and you're, you're able to send out 500 queries to publishers and keep sending till somebody says yes, right? Good. Now, how are you going to get yourself skilled up? You need to read. It's very simple. Mm. You need to read everything in the genre that you want to write in. And then, that's not enough, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. There are people who have studied the art of writing. They've gotten it down to a science. There's certain rules you need to be aware of, right? Go learn them. I read so many books on writing. I had a friend who, was, who read my first stuff and he bought me my very first books on writing. I bought the, uh, the writer's yearbook. I did all of that. And I read these books. Now I've distilled it in all the writing books. I have a whole, I'm looking at my bookshelf now. I have a row that's usually, that's all, if I haven't rearranged it, it's all writing books, books on writing, on dialogue, on characterization, on, on uh, there's, a one, there's one I love. The, I'm trying to remember the title. It's got a crazy title and crazy illustrations. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and I've gotten them to two books now that I, I've actually bought several copies and given it to people. Mm. One of them is called How to Write a Damn Good Novel, and it's by Stephen N. Frey. Okay. The other one is by Strong. Uh, it's called The Elements of Style. It's a very thin book. Yeah. It just helps you structure your sentences. When you say style, it's not it's not the flowery language some people think of as style. It's not you know describing the sunsets in ten paragraphs. No. Yeah. It's about being succinct. Then, you know, it, anyway, you know what I mean? So yeah. mm -hmm. those two books, I find them essential for anybody who's serious about writing and who has no previous training in writing. Sure. Read those two books and they'll get you well on your way. But what you then need to do is just read everything that comes. If you already like write, reading anyway, you're fine. So you already have a whole lot of stuff to do. Now, the story about my mom and asking the question about where is my mom? Is my mom the main character? Do you know it's funny? I did not know she was for a long time. Oh, you know? okay. Yeah, for a long time, people would ask me, who is Amaka? And I'll tell them, well, Amaka is a composite character of women in my life. You know, uh -huh. uh, she takes her name from somebody. She takes some of her backstory from somebody. She does this, she does that. And I believed it, you know, yeah. because I'm, the same way people would say to me, Oh, yeah, a man. For a man, you write such strong female characters. I hate that because I would always think to, to myself and I'll say to them, I don't know any so-called weak female characters because Thank you. the women 
in my books are based on women I know, women around me. So maybe I'm that one person who's never met this weak women. I don't know, you know. So anyway, that's what I believed until it was in um, it was in France, and I'd just done a panel. And during the panel, this lady asked me, um, "Where is your your mother in the book?" And you know, I, I huh? didn't have an answer for her. No, actually, that wasn't what she asked me. She asked me, what's the inspiration for your central character, Amaka? And I gave her the usual spiel. You know, she's a composite character, blah, blah, blah. Then after my panel and after signing books, I'm out there by the tents but where we're having this festival. And then I'm surrounded by people. And then she comes as well and she joins in because she speaks English, so she could join in the conversations. Mm -hmm. And then when she had an opportunity, she was looking me in the eyes like that and she goes, where is your mother in the book? And at that point, it hit me. Mm -hmm. It was and then when I was like, whoa. And I, I confessed that, oh shit, I should have said to you that Amaka is my mom. It makes sense because, you know, she, she fights for other women. Yeah. And for other women she's extremely intelligent yeah my mom yeah uh, extremely beautiful yeah i mean people say that mothers are beautiful but you should see mine <laughs> <laughs> you know fiercely independent feminist and all it was my mom i was writing about my mom it just hit me and the woman just said i knew you know i i didn't i didn't realize it before and that is the reason in the first book easy motion tourist amaka has a lot of sex in the second book in the series, When Trouble Sleeps, no sex. <laughs> okay. I still, and I, I do, I understand. I know it's problematic because <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out what is it about my cisgender male, heterosexual male self yeah. that makes it difficult for me to see my mom as a sexual being. I'm going to deal with that, but yeah, in the in the second book, I'm like, nope, mommy, you're not going to be shagging people up and down in front of the wall. <laughs> Maybe I'll let her have some in the third book. Right, that's a <laughs> actually no, actually the third book, the third book, the manuscript has been submitted, and uh -huh. not only did she not have sex, there was no sex in it. Really. Yeah, because the story was different. You know, I don't believe in gratuitous sex and violence. Sure. You know, the violence has to be necessary for the story. Like I was writing a book about violence against women, you know, in Easy Motion Tories. Mm -hmm. If you don't show that violence, it's just an, a, a further erasure of women. Okay. You know, it's not yeah. intense. It's just saying, yeah, I'm not going to acknowledge the violence that men do to you. So I'm not going to write about it or I'm, I'm not going to describe it, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so there was violence and sex in the first book because that's what the story was. Yeah. The second book, not as much sex. Okay. At least not, not for Amaka. And, <laughs> <laughs> and in the third book, yeah, I can't remember if there's sex in the third book, actually. I've just submitted the manuscript. Okay. For that, yeah. that The third book is called Unfinished Business, the third book in the series. Okay. And it, what is that the last in the series or do you see it going on? It's meant to go on and on and on and on and on and on until I can no longer write. Nice. That said, I'm starting the second series that's going to be set in London. Okay. It's calling it the Bad Coach series. The Bad Coach. Yeah. It's a Nigerian coach that works in London and his clients are metropolitan police officers who've been bad, you know, like unconscious bias, excessive use of force, stuff like that. Sure. Uh, they send them to him to coach them to kind of see the error of their ways, you know, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. And by doing that job, it becomes naturally becomes privy to some of the cases they're working on, you know, because some of them, after he's helped them as a coach, they come back to him, having experienced the power of coaching, they come back to him for help with cases that they're working on. That way he gets to learn about it and somehow, somehow he gets immersed and he gets involved in some case from some former policeman clients. And yeah, and then his former police training, because he used to be a policeman in Nigeria, yeah. comes into play. Wow. I'm loving it. I'm loving the series, man. It's yeah. a new series, so I'm going to have two series going side by side. 
I'm excited for that to come. Yeah. And um, so question, has anyone offered you right or, or come to you for rights, for film rights, anything like that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've sold the film rights. I sold the film rights to, it's actually in development before, nice. before bloody COVID, uh, to Big Talk Productions, the, move, the, the, the production house that did movies like Baby Driver. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah, great guys, great guys. And they've already workshopped the scripts, the stories and everything. And yeah, it's just, it's going well. Wow. Well, you heard it, well. listeners. Read the book and soon, soon, soon check out the film because this is is good action. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, actually, it's uh, it's going to be a TV series. Nobody's doing Even films anymore. better. <laughs> that's true. Even better. That's So that's what I actually thought. I was like, this would be a great TV series. Like yeah. a wonderful, okay, good, good, good. So we're looking forward to that. Um, okay, so taking a little bit of a pivot, and you kind of hit on this in your local speak, but I have a mindset hack question, which is asking you what your favorite or an innovative mindset hack is. So this could be something that actually exists, that you practice, or one that you can imagine. My mindset hack? Mm-hmm. Well, there's, there's quite a few things I do, really. The one I do the most, it's... Actually, it's I'm writing essays. I'm writing a few essays on coaching, and this one I'm writing it as anyway. It's um, it's the use of movement in coaching sessions. Mm. So, and I use it on myself. So I have this thing I do, uh, depending on the client and depending on what we're talking about. I tell them we sit apart from each other without a table, anything between us, and as they're talking to me about their problem, we're bouncing. Uh, um, a tennis ball to each other. The only rule is we can only bounce with, if I'm bouncing with the right hand, you know, we can only use the same hand, mm. basically. Mm-hmm. So I'm bouncing it to you and you're bouncing it to me. I'm using the same hand all the time. You're using the same hand. And then when we come to, we've, we've discussed the problem, you know, and then when we come to, okay, what's the solution? We switch the ball to the other hand. Mm. Okay. And I'm still trying to gather enough evidence that it actually works, but that switch seems to inspire some switch in thinking in people. Huh? I do so I do this also when I'm working with people. Yeah. When I do walking coaching sessions. So if we've been walking in one direction as we're discussing the problem, once it comes to finding solutions, I always turn and say, let's turn around or let's go that way or let's cross the road, just a shift in direction space. And I do this for myself as well. So if I'm self-coaching or if I'm dealing with a difficult situation or just something that needs deep thinking, I spend some time thinking of the problem and then I hold my ball in my hand, my tennis ball, and I'm playing with it, throwing it up and catching it in one hand. When I've exhausted my thinking about the current situation, what the, you know, what I'm trying to deal with. And now I want to look at what can I do about it? I toss the ball to the other hand. Ah. And it seems to work for me. You know, I'm still trying to gather enough evidence to see if it works. Yeah. And I'm going to be talking to my, my own coach about it, or rather I've spoken to them about it. Yeah. And I'm just looking for literature to either back it up or refute it. But yeah, that's a hack that I use for myself. It doesn't need to be a ball. It can be anything. It can yeah, be, yeah. I'm dealing with something. I'm thinking about it in the living room. Okay, now I need to I need to find a solution. Then I'll go to the other room. You know, I'll go somewhere else. Right, you know? right, right. Wow, that's a gem. I'm going to try that myself. That's really an awesome, awesome Yeah, it, I think yeah. it works. Yeah, yeah. Well, at least we'll try it and we'll, we'll get back to you. Too. <laughs> well, Leia, we're almost at the end of our conversation. This has really gone very fast and I've been so blown away by our, all of your insights. Before we go, I want to ask you kind of to kind of dig deeper into, you know, the, the way your mind works. And I like to ask my guests, you're a writer and a reader, but let's pivot a little bit. And what are you listening to these days? Uh, not the news. Of course. <laughs> so, <laughs> totally not the news. I've been listening to a lot of Buena Vista Social Club. Oh, okay. And a friend of mine, another writer, Remy, has sent me because he knows, you know, we share a love for, uh, for Latin music. And he sent me a link to different versions of Cha Cha. Okay. 
And because I write to music, I've been having that playing in the background as I write. Uh -huh. And then after I'm done writing, and I'm just avoiding the news because, you know, there's no point getting yourself upset, right? Yeah. So after I'm done writing, and I just want to have that glass of wine, mm -hmm. I then go on to YouTube on my TV, and then I just allow, I play the first cha-cha song on YouTube, mm -hmm. and then I allow YouTube to decide for me what similar song to play next. Okay. Mm-hmm. And yep. do you, does it typically, because I do that as well, I'll go into one song and just let it play. Does it stay in that genre or does it kind of move around? Actually, it kind of stays in it. Okay. You know, it kind of stays in it. Once in a while, it throws you a curveball and then I need to you know, <laughs> retrain, <laughs> retrain it. <laughs> right, 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 right. Okay, well, that's a great tip. That's Buena Vista Social Club. We'll have this in the show notes. And I want to go back because you mentioned two books, like Elements of Style. That's great. I remember that from high school. How to, the, the other book was How to... How to Write a Damn Good Novel. Okay. And that's by Stephen... Frey, F-R-E-Y. Okay, perfect. Yeah. All right. So do you have any last words or thoughts that you would like to leave us with? Yeah, actually, this is quite profound. Okay. Stay at home. <laughs> I will second that. <laughs> and amen to that. Le, thank you so much for your time and your insights. I look forward to I'm moving into a little bit of some fireside chats and things as we get, you know, to mix it up because we're always going to be remote now. So I want to invite you back at another point and I just want to say thanks. This has been wonderful. Well, thank you. All right. So, All right, then. Global Citizens, thanks for joining us. You are again listening to the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around doing something in the world. You can catch us at localcitizenspod.com and wherever you find podcasts. See you later.